Okay, so welcome everyone um, to the joint seminar between quantum gravity fields and information in Potsdam and the Warsaw String Theory Group. Today we are very happy to have Arjun Carr from the University of Pennsylvania that will tell us about geometric secret sharing in a model of Hawking radiation. Please. All right, thanks very much, Pavel. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to tell you about uh, this recent paper that we had. Uh, here's the archive number. And it's all of this is with these collaborators. So as probably all of you are aware, there's been a lot of recent work uh, involving the black hole information problem, especially in our community. And many of the developments rely on the so-called island formula or quantum extremal surface formula in the ADS CFD context. And one kind of fascinating implication of this is that semi-classical gravity seems to be aware of the evaporation's unitarity. And uh, just as a side comment, almost all of the quantitative work has been done in the context of two-dimensional gravity. And here are some of the main references. So what I want to do today is briefly review the main ideas and then discuss a simple higher dimensional model, which has some interesting and I think general information theoretic structure. And so before I go on, I should just say that uh, I, I can't see anybody's face, so please just uh, unmute yourself and shout out if you have a question. So here's the outline. We'll first start with a review of black hole evaporation, and we'll then discuss a simple geometric model of evaporation. And the last section will be about secret sharing schemes, so you'll understand the title, uh, in the reconstruction of the black hole interior. And we'll conclude with some discussion. So let's get started. So Hawking's semi-classical analysis of black hole evaporation famously shows that a pure state of collapsing matter can evolve into mixed radiation. And this is unitarity loss. And you can kind of qualitatively see this loss of unitarity from the page curve. And we're going to be working in anti desitter space, so we'll use the anti desitter space page curve. So what this is showing is you have some black hole that forms and it slowly starts to radiate. And what Hawking found is at this particular value, which is the entropy of the black hole that you formed, the entropy in Hawking's calculation of the radiation seems to continue to grow beyond the entropy of the black hole. This is a loss of unitarity because the black hole only has so many microstates that the radiation can be entangled with. So what we expect if we insist the evaporation should be unitary is a sharp change that happens right at the entropy of the black hole. And in ADS, that change is just a flatlining. So in flat space, it would be actually a turnover and this curve would decrease. But in ADS, black holes can be in equilibrium with the radiation. So it's just a flatlining of the radiation entropy. So real-time black hole evaporation is a difficult process to model, although it has been done uh, in, in some of this recent work. But we're going to make our lives a little bit easier by considering what we call an evaporation protocol. We'll follow these authors. So the idea is to consider a family of quantum states. So I'm going to call those psi k. And this is just a fairly generic entangled state of, of radiation Hilbert space and the black hole microstates. So these i's you can think of as qubits in the radiation that you're collecting in some lab or some reservoir. And these psi i's are just black hole microstates. So how does this give us access to evaporation? Well, to run the protocol, what we do is we fix the black hole entropy SBH, that's going to be log of the dimension of the Hilbert space of the black hole. So we imagine this is some small band in the Hilbert space, some microcanonical ensemble. And we increase the size of the radiation Hilbert space. And the radiation Hilbert space has dimension K. And as we do this, we draw these microstates at random from the black hole Hilbert space. So what you can see is gonna happen is as we increase this number K, we're including more and more tensor factors in this sum, and we're going to be increasing the entanglement between the radiation factor and the black hole factor. So the goal is going to be to compute the entropy of the reduced density matrix on the radiation, and that's going to depend on K. So let's try and get a qualitative understanding of what's gonna happen. So here's the, the expression for the reduced density matrix as a function of K, and you can see that the crucial part of this formula to understand, because we've taken this ket i and ket j to be orthonormal, the crucial part is this inner product. It's psi j inner product with psi i. So 
you can imagine that if you draw a bunch of random vectors from a large Hilbert space, there's a fairly good probability that they're going to be orthogonal, or at least approximately orthogonal. So if we were to replace this psi j psi i with a delta i j, that is to say, if these random vector draws were exactly orthogonal, then it's easy to see that this reduced density matrix is going to be the maximally mixed state. And so that will have an entropy that looks like log k. But of course, in the protocol, what we said is that the black hole Hilbert space has a fixed dimension. It is not changing. So what that means is when log k exceeds the black hole entropy, this set of inner products cannot be exactly orthogonal. And indeed, there will be linear dependencies. So after we exceed the black hole entropy, one of these psi i's will be some linear combination of all the rest of them. And the rank of this matrix will be bounded. And the rank is bounded exactly at e to the s black hole. So there will be a sharp change in the growth of the entropy as a function of k. And indeed, we'll see that the entropy just flat lines exactly at s black hole. So that's the idea of this protocol. So here comes the second component. The psi i's, I said, were black hole microstates. So what you might have thought is that we need access to their detailed structure involving strings, brains, fuzzballs, whatever, to see their non-orthogonality. And so that non-orthogonality, again, is going to kick in at approximately this order, e to the minus s. So it's a very, very small effect. But the surprise of all the recent work is it seems sufficient to use this quantum QES formula and something called subregion duality. So what is this formula? So in order to draw the pictures, I'll always be working in ADS3. So here's our equal time slice of ADS3. This is the Poincaré disk. And this QES formula says, I take a subregion of the CFT called A. So that's this red region here. And what I'm supposed to do to compute the entropy of the reduced density matrix on A is in the bulk, I have to minimize and extremize over this co-dimension two surface gamma A. So in three dimensions, co-dimension two is dimension one. So this gamma A is just a geodesic. And the functional I'm supposed to extremize is the area of the surface divided by four G Newton plus a bulk contribution with S effective. It's an effective field theory entropy contribution of a region curly A. And this region curly A has to obey this very special constraint, which is sometimes called the homology constraint. And it says that the boundary of curly A should be the surface gamma A union with the region A. And in ADS CFT language, we sometimes say that there is something called subregion subregion duality, which is that this subregion A of the CFT is dual to the subregion curly A of the bulk. That means that whatever physics is happening in the region curly A, we should be able to reconstruct with the boundary region A. So those are the two main components, and here I've reproduced them. So now the main idea is going to be to apply the QES formula to the radiation subsystem in the state psi k. And so to do this, what we're going to need is a geometric model of the state psi k. And so before we get into that, let's just discuss what we expect. So what we expect is before the page transition, the surface associated to the radiation will be empty and the entropy of the radiation will be just an effective field theory entropy. So as the black hole is radiating into this system of qubits in a reservoir somewhere, all that we really have is the effective field theory entropy of the lab environment where we're collecting the qubits. But after the page transition, we expect that this minimal surface will have a transition, that's the page transition, to the horizon. So we'll denote that with RH, the real black hole horizon, and we expect that the entropy should flatline at this black hole. So that's And by subregion subregion duality for the experts, the entanglement wedge of R after the page transition should include the interior in whatever model of microstates we decide to work with. So any questions on this uh, introductory stuff before I move on? Now would be a good time. Okay. So let's keep moving. So here comes the geometric model. So what we want is a higher dimensional model of psi k. That's going to be the goal. And we'll, of course, stick to three dimensions for calculations. So we're going to follow these authors and model these black hole micro 
crusades by placing an end of the world brain with some flavor index i on one side of a thermofield double. So this thermofield double is also called the two-sided eternal black hole. We have some asymptotic region here, that's A, and in the U we would have another asymptotic region on the left-hand side of the wormhole. So what we're looking at here is a spatial slice, a constant time slice of the thermofield double. And this dotted curve here is the horizon, the black hole horizon. But instead of continuing all the way to the other asymptotic boundary, we're going to cut off the geometry with a brain. So this brain will have some action, it will have some dynamics, but we're just going to, I'll, I'll touch on that later. But the only purpose of this brain that I want you to understand is to make a pure state on this boundary. So this brain acts a little bit like a projector. So it projects from, a th from the thermofield double state onto a pure state in this CFT. That's the role of this brain. So how exactly does it do that? Well, geometrically, the way it achieves this projection is that in the presence of the brain, the QES homology constraint is a relative homology constraint. So what that means is that if I'm trying to compute the entropy of some subregion of the CFT, say this little piece here, then I need to consider surfaces that actually pass through the wormhole and end onto the brain. So there can be portions of the brain that are included in the boundary of the region curly A. So the region curly A in this context would be you know, this, uh, this segment between the two green lines bounded by this little piece of the asymptotic region and this little piece of the brain. And so that relative effect causes this, uh, this geometry to be in a pure state. Unfortunately, this introduces a bit of a problem for us uh, because subregions of the brain morally should contribute to the S effective entropy. And it's a little bit difficult to model this contribution without prescribing more structure for the brain than just flavor indices. So we, we could take some very naive model where, you know, unless you have all of the brain, there's no contribution. And if you have any piece of it, it's none, but that's a little bit unnatural and it's a little bit non-local. So we would like a bit more structure on the brain in order to understand how to incorporate the entropy of say this piece of the brain. So here's the solution following these authors in a slightly different way. A convenient way to do this, to introduce more structure, is to introduce a full Hilbert space, H brain, and that has the structure of a holographic 2D CFT. So then the flavor indices that I talked about before are replaced with quantum states in the CFT. And of course, we've taken the CFT to be holographic, so we can then replace the brain with what I'm going to call the inception geometry, which is just the holographic dual of that CFT. So we have one CFT that lives on this asymptotic region, we have another CFT that lives on the brain, and we can replace the brain state, so with a, this gluing surface, so now I've made the brain dotted, because it's not there anymore, and we have this gray disk here. This gray disk is the inception geometry. And indeed, we can choose a state that we like in, uh, in this 2D CFT Hilbert space, we can actually take it to be a black hole if we like. So this is a depiction of a black hole in the inception geometry. And an important note more later is that the inception geometry can have different couplings than the original space-time. So there's no need for the theory on the brain to have, say, precisely the same central charge as the asymptotic theory on the boundary. So we set out in the section to model the state psi k, and if you remember the expression for that state, it was a state in the tensor product Hilbert space of the radiation system and the black hole system. And that's a pure state. It's an overall pure state. So, so far we've only modeled this uh, psi i portion, but the full, what, what it means for this full state to be pure is that the state that we choose on the brain should actually be pure. So it should not just be a black hole. We should actually purify the inception geometry and that creates, again, for the experts, something called an ER equals EPR wormhole. So we can really see that the radiation system, which now has its own asymptotic boundary, so it's completely geometrized, the radiation system is entangled with the real black hole through this long wormhole that we've created. So now the only question left is how to apply the QES formula to these sorts of space times. And what we're going to propose, and I'll try and justify this with some calculations a little bit later, 
we're going to propose that the appropriate homology prescription for QES in this geometry is to just allow them to pass through the gluing surface with some refraction based on the difference in couplings if the QES actually intersects the gluing surface. So what that means is, suppose we consider the entire boundary of the radiation, so R union R bar, then in that case, if we want to compute the entropy, there are two candidates. So the first candidate is this blue minimal surface, which we'll call the inception horizon, and the second candidate is the real black hole horizon in the, the white region. So those are both minimal surfaces, and we're going to consider them both homologous to the region R. So we have to consider both candidates when deciding to minimize and extremize. Similarly, and we'll get back to this point a little bit later, if we consider a subregion of the radiation, there are again two candidates. So the first one is this green candidate that we would call, I guess, the BTZ curve. This is the entropy that you would get in the BTZ black hole. Uh, and the second candidate is this purple curve. And we'll touch on that in the next section. So now it's with, with these rules that we've set out, it's pretty easy to see how the page transition arises in this geometric model. So all we do is we identify the parameter log K with the inception horizon radius. And so it's, this is going to be denoted RH prime. And in general, all the quantities in the inception side of the, ge the geometry will be denoted with primes, and the real quantities will be unprimed. So if we're concerned about computing the entropy of this radiation region, as I said, we have two candidates, and the, incept the evaporation protocol is to steadily increase this RH prime quantity. So if we're in a situation where the entropy associated to this inception horizon is smaller than the entropy of the real horizon, then this is the QES for region R because this is more minimal and the entanglement wedge is going to just be this green region. So the region that we can reconstruct, uh, the subregion that we can reconstruct using the radiation is just this piece of the inception geometry. It does not extend into the real part of the geometry. But of course, after the entropy of the inception horizon is greater than the entropy of the real horizon, and remember, we're keeping the entropy of the real horizon fixed in this process and increasing RH prime. So eventually this relation will hold. After that happens, the real horizon wins in the QES formula. And for the region R, what we have is the QES is the real black hole horizon. And what that means is that the entanglement wedge is this entire green region here. So you can see that after the page transition, the entanglement wedge of the radiation includes this region between the gluing surface the horizon. And this, in our model, is what we think of as the interior, this real region between the black hole horizon and the gluing surface. So that's the page transition in a, in a very simple, uh, very sim simplified model. So uh, before I move on, any questions about this? The next part is a little bit technical. Okay, I don't see any questions. So let's move on to a bit of an aside. So, so far, this entire talk has been pictures, and I, I don't want you to think that the only thing that we did in the paper was draw pictures, although when this project was, when this project started, we initially thought that we were going to write a paper like that. Uh, we actually did do some calculations, so I'll just quickly describe some of those. So we're going to discuss a few details of the gluing construction, and also I want to justify the homology prescription as I promised a little bit earlier. So what we, what we did was we formulated the gluing conditions with two objectives. So the first objective was the gluing produces a long wormhole. And what I mean by a long wormhole is that there are two minimal surfaces. So there are two horizons. This is the real black hole horizon and the inception horizon. And the next condition was, so this, this first condition seems to be necessary to reproduce the page transition. The second condition was a little bit unspecified, but we decided it was most natural. And we decided that all of the stress energy on the brain should be holographic. So the brain is moving in the real space time. It has some induced stress energy. And what we thought is that all of this stress energy should be holographic. That seemed to be the most natural thing to do. 
And these two requirements lead to the following gluing conditions. So the induced metric HAB from the real side is equal to the induced metric from the inception side. And of course, these expressions are all up to coordinate transformations. Uh, so that was the first condition. And the second condition is that what is essentially the Brown-York stress tensor of the real side should be equal to the Brown-York stress tensor of the inception side. And these are spiritually similar to the Israel junction conditions. But instead of producing a thin shell geometry, like some, some kind of Vaidya collapse geometry, they produce a long warp hole. So what these gluing conditions allow us to do is actually solve for the brain trajectory, given a choice of brain state. And so remember that the choice of the state on the brain is parameterized by a choice of inception horizon size. So we're just choosing the temperature of the inception black hole. So I don't want to get too far into the details, but I'll just flash these formulas. So the Euclidean BTC metric is given by this expression, which probably all of you know. And the inverse temperature is related to the horizon radius in this way. And this L is the ADS radius. And with this ansatz, the solution to these gluing conditions is given by the following trajectories. So this is the, uh, the real side trajectory of the brain. And this is the inception side trajectory of the brain. And you can see that there are two length scales that have been introduced here, like length scales other than the ADS radius and the inception ADS radius, I mean. So these are RT and RB. So those are the two crucial length scales that we introduce. And what we found through quite a bit of analysis is that we require that RB should be less than both of the horizons and both of the horizons should be less than RT. So that, guarantees us a real solution with the page transition. And so here are the expressions for RT and RB. And as you can probably imagine, these expressions and this inequality constrains the evaporation protocol that we're allowed to run. You can see the paper for many, many more details on this issue. So now having discussed the gluing, I want to discuss, discuss the homology prescription. So to justify that prescription, we use the replica trick. And the replica trick, of course, requires a Euclidean construction of these space times. So on the left here, you can see the Euclidean version of the space times that we've been considering. So, so far, I've only been talking about time slices, but this is really a full Euclidean construction. And I've suppressed a circle everywhere here. So that's why this figure looks two dimensional, but we are working in three dimensional gravity. So I've suppressed a circle. And if we were just working with the usual two sided BTZ black hole, with none of this inception or brain or gluing or anything, we would just have this outer, uh, this outer geometry. So that's the light colored geometry. And it would just have been completed into a cigar, so the usual uh, Euclidean ADS cigar geometry. And now we have a brain. So the brain has some trajectory in the real side and we've dualized it and glued convex to convex so there is a smaller Euclidean cigar inside the larger Euclidean cigar. And the smaller cigar is precisely the inception geometry, Euclidean inception geometry. So the boundary conditions for this sort of solution look like this. It looks a little bit like a crescent moon. And what we're supposed to do with the replica trick is to compute trace of, row, trace of the reduced density matrix to some power and to produce that, we can place a cut either on the real side, like this, or on the inception side. So we're actually interested in the, uh, the entanglement entropy of the radiation. So the cut that we would place would actually be on this, uh, this light colored side. And we then replicate the boundary conditions. So you can see the trace of rho r cubed here, a contribution to trace of rho r cubed. So we've replicated the boundary. We have now three real sides, real boundaries, so these solid colored black lines, and also three inception colored boundaries. So these are these uh, light gray colored lines. And they've been glued together at these crosses. And what we've done is we've filled in these boundary conditions with a particular geometry. And that particular geometry, I want to point out, has a replica symmetric fixed point. So there's a Z3 symmetry to this figure, which just corresponds to rotating. And there's a fixed point under this action. And that's what we'll be using to read off the entropy. So 
In fact, the geometry that I showed on the previous slide is not the only way to fill in the boundary conditions. Of course, to perform the gravitational path integral, we have to consider all ways to fill in the boundary conditions. And there are two replica symmetric ways in general that don't involve any sort of higher topologies. So the area of the replica symmetric fixed point is going to give the entanglement entropy. And these are the two ways that we can fill in the surfaces, that we can fill in the boundary conditions, excuse me. So the first way on the left, we have a replica symmetric fixed point in the gray region. And remember the gray region is the inception region. So the replica symmetric fixed point in that region is just the inception horizon. So we're going to get a contribution from this object, which is the inception horizon entropy. Now there's of course another solution, and this right-hand solution is the one that we displayed previously. So these are two-dimensional projections of, uh, of that three-dimensional figure on the previous page. And in this right-hand figure, the contribution is from the real side replica symmetric fixed point. So you can see that the fixed point is in the white region. So what this is, is a contribution from the real black hole horizon. And we get the real black hole horizon entropy. And so you can see that there's going to be an exchange in dominance between these two saddles in the replica trick. So once the entropy of this object increases, when we perform the path integral, the saddle point that dominates is going to be changing to this one after the inception horizon becomes suitably large. So in the calculation of this entanglement entropy of the radiation, the left geometry corresponds to what we would call the Hawking phase, or the phase where the entropy is growing, the radiation entropy is growing, and the right geometry corresponds to the page phase, because in this geometry, the contribution to the radiation entropy is finite and fixed. Any questions about this replica trick stuff before I move on? Yeah, so um, mm -hmm. I'm a little confused about how I would actually engineer this in a known CFT like the symmetric product. So, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we, we, we didn't have a top-down construction of any of this. So we were kind of being agnostic to, to what the actual CFT is. Of course, what you would love to do is take a fixed CFT, like the symmetric product, for example, and in the dual geometry, you would like to actually put some D brains uh, in, inside the black hole. Uh, it, it would be very interesting to do this, but unfortunately, we were not able to, to find a, a clean way to do it. But I, I would guess that, yeah, so, so one, one thing I would say is I'm not exactly sure how much more you would learn from doing, an, doing a, a top down analysis than this bottom up stuff. It would certainly be interesting from like a fundamental perspective to see if it was possible, but I, I have a hard time imagining what else I would be able to do in, in the top-down construction that I well, could not do in the bottom-up construction. You have to worry whether all your pictures are in the swampland. Let's see, I have to worry about whether all the pictures are in the swampland. Right. What is the swamp land? It's solutions of bottom-up theories that actually don't exist in string theory. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So, so I, I would say we, we certainly could work with a, with a top-down model, but the object that sits inside the, so inside the, uh, the thermofield double, so of course we have this end-of-the-world brain, right? And the, the end-of-the-world brain is really the thing that you might worry about. The, the rest of it, I think, is just pretty standard ADS-CFT. But the end of the world brain is, I would say, the worrisome part. And I think what I would say is you should, you should get the same results that we obtain using whatever you know, physical excitations exist in the, in the top-down model. So it, I don't think it should make a difference. So it, it may indeed be that these pictures are in the swampland you know, for, for a, a, a brain that uh, that has the prescribed dynamics that we that we chose, but I think the even the top-down model will reproduce exact, exactly the same results. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's yeah. It's certainly, a, it would be very very interesting to to construct this in a top-down way. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So now let's move on to secret sharing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to generalize our purification. 
So of course, we, we started with some asymptotic region and we had a wormhole and we placed an end of the world brain here that we then dualized, but we can choose the state of the end of the world brain to be whatever we like, of course. And what we're going to do now is we're going to split the radiation into two disjoint pieces. So you can see here we have some coefficients, C, I1, I2, I3, and those are controlling which of the states in the first radiation Hilbert space and the second radiation Hilbert space appear in this summation. And of course, we entangle as usual with our black hole microstates, psi I3. And it's probably not hard to guess that the geometric model for this sort of state will be a multi-boundary wormhole. So we'll denote that with psi, and then these this M vector is the moduli of the multi-boundary wormhole. So that moduli, I just mean these causal horizon lengths. So now instead of just one inception horizon, we have the inception horizon, which controls the entanglement between the radiation and the black hole. So that's this closest horizon to the gluing surface. But we also have horizons associated with the region R1 and the region R2. So there are two horizons, each associated with the individual radiation factors, as well as a third horizon. So we're going to package all of that into an M vector, and of course we have our usual RH prime. So the page transition in the multi-boundary wormhole purification still occurs, of course, uh, when RH prime over GN prime is greater than the entropy of the real black hole. And so after the page transition, we expect that the entanglement wedge of R1 union R2 should contain the entire interior. But after the transition, we do expect that if you have access to part of the radiation, say I collect you know, half of the radiation in my lab, but half of it goes off in the other direction and I can't access it, it's a little bit unnatural to think that I can't reconstruct anything in the interior using, using the, say, 50% of the radiation that I have. And so what we expect, in fact, is that there should be a new class of quantum extremal surfaces, which are homologous to, for example, R1, that compete with the causal horizons. So the key point here is if the causal horizons were the only things in the game, then I would not expect to ever be able to reconstruct anything in the interior if I only had access to R1. That seems a little bit unnatural. I, I should be able to get at least something from the interior if I have a lot of radiation collected in this region R1. And so we need a new class of surfaces to do that because these causal horizons are not sufficient. And so the new class that we're going to introduce are these infalling geodesics. So what they do is they kind of wrap this saddle point here and they fall into the gluing surface. And then there's some refraction condition which sends them into the interior of the black hole. And so shaded in purple here is the entanglement wedge of R1 if this infalling geodesic were to be the dominant one in the quantum extremal surface formula, if it were to be the surface gamma R1. And so you can see that it actually includes a little piece of the interior here. And the point of this section will be to understand just how far we can push that, you know, whether we can consider a region R1 in this multi-boundary wormhole purification do we think it can reconstruct the entire interior? Can it get half the interior? That's the sort of question that we'll be concerned with here. So a key point that I want to make is to answer a question that I just raised, that dominance of the infalling geodesics implies the existence of a geometric secret, which is shared by the radiation boundaries. This is the purpose of the title. So if we suppose that this infalling geodesic is actually the dominant contribution to the radiation region R1, then if we choose all of these moduli to be equal, then just by symmetry, there should be a similar infalling geodesic that dominates for radiation region R2. And that one will look like this. And the key point is that the homology constraint is telling you that these surfaces cannot be exactly the same because this top surface is only homologous to R1, the bottom surface is only homologous to R2, so they cannot actually coincide. There is no such surface in this geometry, and you can see now that there's a purple shaded region which lies outside the entanglement wedge of R1 and the entanglement wedge of R2. So to answer the question that I raised on the previous slide, 
if I only have access to one of these regions, say R1 or maybe just R2, I cannot reconstruct any physics that's going on in this purple shaded region. It's a secret that I can only reconstruct if I have access to both of them. Even if I have classical communication between these two guys, so if I have some lab R1 and I'm in contact with my friend in lab R2 and we're both collecting radiation, if we just classically communicate our results to each other, we can still never reconstruct anything in this, in this uh, purple shaded region. So the entanglement wedge of the union is not equal to the entanglement wedge to the union of the entanglement wedges. So how far can we push this? Well, it turns out that maybe surprisingly, there is a remnant of this secret, even when the inception portions of the QES for R1 and R2 are coinciding. So remember that they cannot be exactly the same surface, but at least in the inception portion, they can coincide. So you'll see that the R1 QES is intersecting this Lewin surface at two points. I'm trying to uh, show with my mouse here. And the R2 QES is intersecting the Lewin surface at two different points. So you can ask what happens when that pair of four points comes together and becomes just a, a pair of two points. And so that's the picture on the right. And what you can see is that because of the geometry of the BTZ black hole, so this, uh, this, this right side picture is essentially looking down from this gluing surface onto the black hole. So it's, uh, it, it's a coordinate patch of this interior region. And you can see what's happening is the real, re the real parts of the QES for R1 and R2 are actually touching on the gluing surface. So they touch here on the left and they touch here on the right. But even when they touch, the minimal surfaces in the real side are such that there is still this purple shaded region which is impossible to reconstruct. And one thing that I, a very important thing that I want to point out here is that this purple shaded region always includes the region just behind the real black hole horizon. So what have we uncovered from these pictures? So the page transition represents a point of what I will call perfect secret sharing. So what that means is that no subset of the radiation boundaries can reconstruct anything in the interior, but all of them together can reconstruct everything. So just when I sit right at the page transition, if I have access to all of the radiation, I can reconstruct the entire interior. But if I only have access to a subset, I cannot reconstruct anything. And fundamentally, the reason that happens is because these moduli will be the dominant contribution in the QES formula when I sit right at the page transition. But what the multi-boundary wormhole model is teaching us is that this secret sharing scheme is weakened in a geometric way. And there's a protected remnant near the real black hole horizon. So as we continue the evaporation process long after the page transition, there are these transitions to the infalling geodesics. That's the main lesson to take away. And even after these infalling geodesics start to dominate the calculation, we can evaporate for an arbitrarily long time. We can run this protocol for an arbitrarily long time. And if we've split the radiation in an appropriate way, so maybe half of it is in R1 and half of it is in R2, then there are regions which we can never influence if we only have access to one of the, re one of the radiation boundaries. And this is a, a quantitative example of some intuition that we often cite, which is that one usually needs immense computational control uh, to manipulate space-time just behind the real black hole horizon by performing unitary operations in radiation collected in a lab. So it's usually we think that if I have access to some sub subsystem of qubits that I've collected and placed some radiation in, if I don't have access to all of the radiation, then it should be pretty hard for me to say, create a firewall behind the real black hole horizon. And this, this uh, multi-boundary wormhole model is a quantitative example of precisely that effect. The region just behind the black hole horizon, the real black hole horizon, is protected. So if I jump through, I shouldn't be able to get killed immediately. Any questions on the qualitative stuff before I move on to uh, a bit more technical explanation of how we actually conclude some of these things? All right. 
Sorry, Arjun, I, I had a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, so this uh, infilling geodesics, how would you compute them in the CFTs in some of some sites of this R1 or whatever? There, there are some extremal geodesics of this full formula, right? With the quantum, I mean, of the quantum entropy. That's right. Yeah. With some particular choice of this uh, end of the world brain matter, right? Yes. Uh huh. But then uh, you should be able to compute them as some. I don't know, from some correlation functions, like two point functions yeah, in this R1. Good. Yeah, so we, we we would we should we should be able to compute them, you know, using some uh some some twist operators in region R1 or R2. Yeah, that should be uh possible. We would need a bit more detail of the actual state. So if you remember, I I was pretty uh cavalier about defining the state size. Uh, I, I didn't exactly tell you how we were collecting the radiation, uh, but you, if if you just were if you were able to choose that state in a particular way, then you should be able to compute this with some twist operators. Yeah, and there should be a transition that happens of that correlation function. Yeah, okay. and it should happen after it should happen after the page transition. So this is really an effect that happens after the evaporation has been proceeding for for quite some time. It's a non-perturbative effect, indeed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. So let's move on to uh, a bit more of the calculation. So, so far, everything has been just uh, picture proofs. But here, I want to describe exactly how we did this calculation. And there's a, a very long appendix in our paper where you can see all of the details that you know, the, the formulas would take up the whole slide if I were to put them here, but I'll describe how we did the calculation. So to actually calculate these things, we work with quotients of the upper half plane. So we'll always be working on this equal time slice of ADS. And this quotient of the upper half plane is going to form the spatial topology of our wormhole. So we we'll sometimes call this covering space. This H2 is the upper half plane, and we're going to quotient by a group. And this group gamma, is a discrete subgroup of SL2R, and this will be generated by some hyperbolic elements acting via these linear fractional transformations. And of course, this is the condition that the determinant of this object should be one. So how does this actually work? Well, we have this Z, which is our coordinate on the upper half plane. So here's the figure. And suppose we want to identify a point Z with the point mu squared times Z. So we want to make a scaling transformation and identify those points. Well, in this SL2R language, it corresponds to this matrix. So A is mu, B and C are zero, and D is one over mu. And we'll call that gamma one. So that's our generator, the generator of this group capital gamma. So the full capital gamma is just given by integer powers of, uh, of this matrix gamma one. And we can ask, what is the effect on the upper half plane of this transformation? Well, let's start by considering these geodesics. So geodesics on the upper half plane are just semicircles. So here's an orange geodesic that I've drawn with some orientation. And under this identification, this geodesic is mapped to just a larger semicircle. So this, the radius of the semicircle has changed, but its shape is exactly the same. So what this tells you is that the region between these two geodesics is now a fundamental region for the quotient. And so you can see pretty easily if I were to glue this orange semicircle to the bigger orange semicircle, what I would form is a long tube, a cylinder. And this tube would have an extremal surface, which in this case lies along the y-axis in the uh, complex plane. And this minimal surface is nothing but the black hole horizon. So there's an asymptotic region A that goes all the way to the boundary, and there's another asymptotic region B. So what we've seen here is that under this identification, the upper half plane turns into the spatial slice of the eternal BTZ black hole. And we can control what the entropy or what the horizon radius is by controlling this parameter, mu squared. So that's what tells us how big the wormhole is. So we can, uh, we can boost our, our power a little bit by, and visualize these long wormholes also by using covering space. And the only thing that we need to understand in order to do this is that constant Schwarzschild radial coordinate corresponds to a fixed angle in covering space. So of course, 
in, uh, in, in say this patch, there's a short child coordinate patch. And if we want to understand how to draw a constant radial hypersurface, then all we have to do is draw a fixed angle surface. So that's this dotted red line. You can see is uh, this dashed red line is at fixed angle, and that's the position of the brain. So it's at fixed radius. And we need two covering space pictures to draw the two sides of the wormhole. So you can see on the left here, we have the asymptotic region A, that corresponds to this region. On the right, we have an asymptotic region R, that's this region here. And they're both glued at this fixed rate, short child radial coordinate, which is the gluing surface. And of course, we have the real horizon, which is this piece of the y-axis, and the inception horizon, which is on the other figure, the same piece of the y-axis. So now let's turn to the three boundary setup because that's the calculation that we want to explain. So in the three boundary setup, we're going to need not only the generator gamma one, but we also need a generator gamma two. So there will be two elements generating this group capital gamma that we're going to quotient by. And so what is this gamma two? Well, in order to make this multi-boundary wormhole, we need several asymptotic regions. So you can see there's R1 here, and there's R2 and R2 prime will be glued together. And so the goal is to identify the two orange geodesics and also to identify the two green geodesics. And that will form our multi-boundary wormhole, or at least a piece of the multi-boundary wormhole. So you can see that gamma, the effect of gamma two is to map the smaller uh, green circle into the uh, the further away green circle. So how does that happen? Well, this transformation, you can send a semicircle on the x-axis uh, at center xb and radius rb into the unit circle. So the effect of this transformation, uh, if you work it out, is to map an arbitrary semicircle on the x-axis into the unit circle. Then we have this transformation, which you'll recognize as the modular S transformation. And the effect of this is to reverse the orientation. So of course, you'll see these little orientation arrows here are reversed. So if we want to map one to the other, we eventually need to reverse the orientation. So we reverse the unit circle orientation. And then this transformation, this final transformation, is just to send the unit circle out to uh, the, the other green circle at, uh, at center XA and radius RA. And so then this gray region will form a fundamental region for this, uh, this piece of the multi-boundary wormhole that we've depicted by gluing on to uh, the, the asymptotic region, again, convex to convex. And these, uh, these blue circle, these blue dashed lines are nothing but the causal horizons. So this M1 corresponds to this causal horizon here for region R1. And when M2 and M2 prime are joined under the identifications, they will join to form this causal horizon of region R2. And of course, M3 is just this. So how do we actually compute the infalling geodesics? So in covering space, what we need to draw is the real side and the inception side picture. And the interesting part is the inception side picture. So what we have here is a piece of a semicircle that is coming in and intersecting the gluing surface at some point S1, let's say. And if we were to continue this purple curve inside the white region, so if we were to map it outside the fundamental region, the action of gamma one and gamma two collectively would map those points back into the fundamental region. So that's precisely what the generators do. They map points outside fundamental regions into them. And that those points of the curve would precisely be this larger piece of the infalling geodesic. So these two are smoothly joined at these points that intersect the green, uh, the, the two green circles. They're identified there and they're smooth. And this larger piece intersects at some point S2. And the region in between this S1 and S2, these two points, is the brain region that gets captured by this infalling geodesic. So that's the analog so if, if we're considering this as a candidate QES for region R1, then this region in solid red would be this region on the, uh, the non-covering space diagram. So you can see pretty clearly that this region is homologous to, uh, to R1 just by pulling it back here. 
And of course, there is a piece on the real side of the geometry. It looks a little bit funny. And in the paper, we actually use BTZ coordinates uh, to compute this length. But of course, you can draw it in covering space as well, if you like. And it looks a little bit like this. And that corresponds to this piece of the infalling geodesic. And so once you have all these pictures drawn, uh, and another key realization that makes the whole thing go is that once I specify S1 and S2, the infalling geodesic is actually unique on the inception side. So I only have to specify S1 and S2, and then all that I have to do is minimize over S1 and S2 in order to find the minimal length uh, geodesic. So after you understand all that, it's just some pretty basic trigonometry that leads to the, the long formulas in, in our paper. So in order to study evaporation, we have to choose a protocol. And so the, the protocol that we chose, again, is going to be all the moduli set to be equal to each other. So all three of these causal horizons are going to set, be set equal in length. And then we're going to increase them. So we have M here, M here, and then the final modulus is just RH prime, and they're all equal, and we're going to increase all of them. So that's going to increase the entanglement between the full radiation system and the black hole, and it's also going to increase the entanglement of the two radiation regions with each other. So here's a plot of the various entropies associated to all these curves as we increase RH prime. So that's the inception radius. Now this dashed blue curve is the entropy associated to a single causal horizon. So maybe this horizon, it could be this one, or this other R2 horizon, we've set them all to be equal. So they all have the same entropy. And you can see that in the beginning, there's a linear growth, and eventually we encounter this dashed black line. And the dashed black line is the fixed entropy of the real black hole horizon. So you can see the page curve on this plot is just going to be linearly increasing and then a flat line if we were computing the entropy of R1 union R2. But if we only want the entropy of R1, then we have two candidates. The candidates are this blue dashed curve, which is steadily increasing, but the other candidate is the infalling geodesic, which is in purple. And the entropy of that is shown here in purple. And you can see that after the page time, there is a point where there's a crossover. There's an additional crossover, and this infalling geodesic becomes the dominant, uh, the dominant contribution in the QES formula. So this is really, it becomes the true minimum, and the causal horizon plays no further role in, uh, in, in computing the entropy. So we can really see that the entanglement wedge goes over to, uh, to include a portion of the interior. And I should also comment that this result seems extremely robust. So you, you can choose almost any boundary conditions you like on, on the brain. You can give it whatever dynamics you like, and it seems that this effect always happens. So no matter what, you know, at what the choices you make, it seems like this is pretty unavoidable. We discussed this a little bit more in the paper. I haven't discussed it here. So let's conclude with a bit of a summary. So we've proposed a higher dimensional model of black hole evaporation, and this model reproduces the page curve and it demonstrates the appropriate replica saddle exchange uh, and also allows for completely geometric quantum extremal surfaces. So there is no discussion of a bulk entropy because we geometrize everything. So that was a nice advantage of this model. And it seems to be a very robust feature that partial reconstruction of the interior occurs after splitting the radiation. So it does not seem to depend on the particular, you know, the particulars of the brain that we choose, but it's just very robust. And the horizon in all of these examples is the most protected region in a geometric secret sharing scheme. So we can tell if a point can be reconstructed or whether it's a secret by just say, seeing where the point is, whether it lies in some connected entanglement wedge or not. And I'll just leave with one, uh, one parting comment that it would be quite interesting to explore these long wormholes in more detail. Uh, they, uh, it, it might be interesting to explore them in particular for cosmological applications. I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, we still have time for several questions, so mm -hmm. please unmute and show yourself if you want to ask the question. Excuse me. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. 
uh, I have a question ab about your initial slide. Okay. Can, can, can you move to that? Is it this one? Uh, turn back. And, uh, and you, maybe here, uh, uh, and, and you and you said and before the before the page time in if I remember correctly you mentioned that and the, and to there is no uh, extreme service before the page time so the Hawking so the, so the Hawking radiation entropy only have a contribution from as effective uh, which means uh -huh. uh, uh, which means the bulk effect the entropy of bulk effect theory. So uh -huh. I have a question. Uh, if if there is no uh, extreme surface, um, what's the what's the box subregion uh, you referring to as effective? Ah, uh, good. So what I have in mind here is that this S effective contribution is going to come from the inception geometry. So when I when I was saying that the inception procedure geometrizes everything, what I have in mind is that this inception geometry you can think of as kind of fake. So the real space time, all we have is a CFT and there's some brain that's moving on one side of the thermofield double. So this inception geometry, you should think of as a bulk contribution to the entropy. So that's what I mean when I say that the only thing you have is S effective and the S effective contribution is coming from a minimal surface that lives in the inception geometry. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah, so you, you should envision that Entropies that come from curves in the inception geometry are bulk entropy contributions. Thanks. Yep. Other, other questions? So if not, then I'm going to stop the record button. Okay.